I'd like to tell you a story today. It's uh, taken from a little book called Romance of Rennell Island. These are a series of books that were uh, published by Good News Publishers. Uh, they were called One Evening Condensed Books, and they took missionary biographies and put them into a little book. This one's um, about 60 pages or something like that, 64 pages. And uh, this is a book by Northcote Deck, who was a missionary in the South Pacific. Um, if you can find any of these little books, you, you should try to get them. Uh, there's a, a whole slew of them. And uh, they are so encouraging. And uh, I'm going to try and condense this, but uh, I'm, it's already a one evening condensed. So I'm not sure how much more I can condense it. It's a bit like making instant coffee in the microwave so you can go back in time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to try and do the best I can and hit some of the highlights of this wonderful book. Uh, you may be familiar with the term Guadalcanal. It was a famous uh, battle place between the U.S. and Japan in the Solomon Islands. And uh, we'll be thinking about that in just a minute. But let me begin by reading to you a well-known verse taken from John's Gospel, chapter 12. The Lord Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. A little story within a story. There was a family in St. Catharines where I grew up, and the wife and uh, several of the children put their trust in the Lord Jesus. But the father was quite a crusty old fellow. His name was Harry Gale. He had been a seed salesman for a, a seed company down in uh, New Jersey, the Stoke Seed Company. And his responsibility was all of Canada. He mostly sold uh, in Ontario. And uh, during the Great Depression, the seed company floundered and they sold the Stoke Seed Company to Harry Gale. It's now one of the largest seed companies in Canada and the U.S. They have several places in the U.S. as well as in Canada. And uh, in speaking with him one night, he was quite resistant to the gospel. And he said to me that one of the reasons he didn't believe the Bible was for this verse. And he said, the Bible says that unless a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He said, if my seeds die, I throw them away. Well, his problem was that he was wrongly defining what death was. The assumption here was that death is the annihilation of the seed, the, the cessation of existence. But that is not what death is in the Bible. The death that the Bible speaks about is always separation. When a person dies, they don't cease to exist, but what happens is their soul leaves their body. There's separation. The body is lying there on the bed, and people standing around the bed say, he's gone. <laughs> the body's right there. What do you mean he's gone? Well, the real part of him, the essence of him, the soul of him has gone and separated from the body. Likewise, eternal death is separation from God. So when the Lord Jesus says that a corn of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it doesn't mean that there's no existence, no life left to the seed. What happens is the seed ceases to exist as a seed. It has to be willing to change from a seed into a plant. And that plant will then produce much grain. And this is the point that Jesus is making. That if we want to maintain our own integrity and make our own choices and live for ourselves and our own plans and our own dreams, in the end that will all fail. If, on the other hand, we are prepared 
to allow the life of Christ to transform us into a seed multiplying creature, into someone who actually is able to share the word of life with others and see them spring into life, if that's what happens. And through that process, he says, we end up hating our life. And what he means is we diminish the value of our own will and our own way and our own pleasures and our own plans so that the life of Christ can flow through us. And in the end, we will see this bumper crop of blessing that comes through our lives as a result of us being willing to die to self so that we might be alive. And Paul says it in other terms when he says, I die daily, or I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So let's think a little bit about the story. You may not be familiar with the Solomon Islands. Uh, They're a string of islands uh, coming down from New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, down uh, to the east, north and east of Australia, down towards New Zealand. And there are six major volcanic islands, quite a number of smaller islands. But um, uh, the South Sea Evangelical Mission, with which North Coat Deck was affiliated, um, also his sister and brother who worked with the same mission, it grew out of a work that began in 1882. There were a number of these Solomon Island people both Polynesian and Melanesian, who were brought to Australia and primarily Queensland to to work there in really as slave labor, the the uh, sugar plantations in Queensland, and uh, for many years that was the case. Well, then when Britain abolished slavery, many of these people had been reached with the gospel. In fact, he says here that um, there were about 12,000 converts. They were shipped back to the Solomon Islands after the end of slavery. And uh, soon, he says, there were 30 missionaries and hundreds of native pastors and teachers who carried on the work. Many of them were entirely Christian villages there. And he tells how during the Second World War, American aviators landed at the Kwai Anchorage near uh, Nefinua, the mission station on the east side of Malaita. And these uh, these airmen, these uh, U.S. Air Force boys, they asked the, the locals, what do you think is the most valuable thing the white man has brought to you? Knives, axes, sewing machines, or what? The answer was remarkable. The best thing the white man has brought to us is the Bible, the Word of God, because it has changed our lives and brought us new life. And uh, these these, uh, Solomon Islanders uh, were able to rescue many American airmen when their planes were shot down or crashed into the sea. And the Americans were amazed at the friendliness of these people and their care and consideration. They were astounded. Here here was one story. One airman brought in by canoe after his plane had crashed. And uh, he was amazed to hear the natives having a prayer meeting, asking the Lord that he might recover from his many wounds. And he did recover. And... uh, Through this, this American airman was saved through the testimony of these people. Well, there's a lot more to it than that, but I've I've got to scoot on. But um, to the south of these main islands, south of Guadalcanal, there was this Rennell Island, and he describes it. And he says that Rennell Island lies nearly 100 miles to the south of San Cristobal. And uh, it's about 45 miles long and 10 across. Um, It's about 20 miles in circumference. 
both islands, this uh, island, uh, Rennell, and also Bellona, consist entirely of coral. And in the case of Rennell, the land seems to have been an old coral reef with enclosed lagoon, which had grown up round an extinct volcano. The hole had since been bodily and regularly raised to a height of some 300 feet. Seen from a distance at night, Rennell is most difficult to distinguish from the general horizon being perfectly level on the skyline. It's surrounded by perpendicular cliffs of rugged coral like the walls of a prison, which indeed it was to its isolated inhabitants. And so he says these people, until they came to this island, these people had absolutely no contact with the outside world. And um, when they landed there, he said uh, they, they couldn't communicate anything to them. These people knew absolutely no common words. And, um, but what happened was they would uh, take a few volunteers on their little boat, their sailboat, and they would take them back to the base where this brother, Northcote Deck sister, would uh, painstakingly work with them, learn some words, uh, help them to understand the way of salvation. And little by little, they saw some of these people saved. And then they would bring them back to the island. Well, this was a very slow process. And at first, uh, the, the people they were bringing to their island were so homesick, they couldn't concentrate. They, it didn't work very well. However, there were three um, people who came from other islands who were a little familiar with some of the wording of the people on Rennell Island, and uh, they agreed to move there and to live among the people. And so he tells this story how they, they came to the spot. It was extremely difficult to, to land there, to find an anchorage, extremely difficult to climb up these cliffs, uh, sharp coral rock that cut their hands and so on, and then eventually to come into the jungle. And at first they were surrounded by these people who were brandishing spears and so on. Quite an amazing thing. But anyway, the story goes on until they um, were able to bring these three um, teachers um, Christians from the Solomon Islands, they were able to bring them uh, to live there. And they built them a little hut at a certain spot. Um, let's see if I can find the spot in the story here. Here we are. Um, he says it was hard work building that house. It took us three days to finish it off on the top of the cliff. So these these three intrepid young a national workers decided to come and live there among them. So he says uh, that they built them just one room, a galvanized iron roof to catch rainwater, a square iron tank to store it. We left them a good supply of rice and biscuits and tools to make their gardens with. Scores of smiling natives surrounded us as we worked and as this novel style of house was being built. All right, so anyway, uh, oh yeah, it was at Kangava Bay in 1910. So they they then left them there, and uh, they they were gone for quite some time. When they returned, they thought that uh, these three men would be watching for them as the as the uh, the season that allowed for them to travel in the sea. It was a very dangerous piece of sea to be traveling in, but, but at the end of 1910, they returned to the island with their ship called the Evangel. And uh, he says, as we neared the place, we could not help picturing how they must have watched the western horizon day after day for the ship. We found instead a silent shore a ruined house, three heaps of human bones. They, they realized afterwards that uh, they had been hacked to pieces. The murderers had killed them 
and they found out it was basically to steal uh, their instruments, their tools, their axes, and so on. It was not out of some viciousness, but because they wanted these things. And they found out the Rennellies were not cannibals, but their heads were hacked off, the legs and arms split open to get the long bones for spearheads. Their bodies were left unburied in the sun, but they discovered that the local women had cut their foreheads with knives as an evidence that they were grieving for the death of these three. Um, and so he says, With reverent hands we gathered together all the mortal remains of our three friends who had come as God's ambassadors. We buried them on the beach, not far from the grave of the last great chief, all looking out to the sun setting in the west. Yet we knew that our honored friends are really awaiting the great sunrising of the Son of Righteousness, side by side with the old chief, for whom we came too late. They await that great day of the coming of the Prince of Peace. Well, they um, then found it very difficult to get permission to come to the island. The government, hearing of the murder of these three, uh, said that they couldn't uh, leave any more native teachers on Rental Island, and uh, no white missionaries were allowed to settle there. And this greatly grieved them because they believed that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church and that this would be the beginning of an effort to see these people saved. However, as time went by, uh, the government uh, wanted to send uh, medical services to the island, and they didn't have a ship to use. And so he wrote a letter to the authorities and said that we will provide the ship. We will take them if we can go and stay, at least for a little time. And so they were given permission to revisit Rennell, um, but just for a very short time, just a week or so. So they, they were able to get there, and while they were there, uh, they discovered that there were some people willing to go with them and uh, to, to learn the language, to, to hear the gospel. And what do you know, um, these recruits, some of them trusted the Lord. And uh, they were able to, to bring them back to the island. And um, uh, then they had to leave for quite a while. When they returned, listen to this. This is so exciting. Um, about 8 a.m., Rennell was sighted on the far horizon. The way seemed ever so long, and the question that was on our minds was, why are we to come first to the eastern anchorage? All right, They couldn't land where they normally did, and they end up coming to a different spot. However, we managed to anchor safely in the gathering dusk, and early next morning went to shore. No signs of life were visible. No marks upon the sand. We climbed the cliffs and reached the top and paused for prayer for guidance. On and on we went with few signs of life till at last we came to the clearing of the village. And then, suddenly, there came into view a large, well-built church standing on the very site of Taupongi's old taboo house. <laughs> the house they built to house their idols. They had torn it down, and in its place, they had built a church building. As we approached, from back and front, there streamed out a large crowd of men, women, and children. We had found the people at their morning worship. Then they gathered in a group and led th uh, three hearty cheers of welcome. This after two long years of silence and isolation. I looked into Taupongi's face and saw the change. I saw his people so happy, their bodies clean and shining, their faces radiant as they clustered round us both. Taupongi, you love the Lord Jesus now? Yes, this time I love Jesus. But what about your Atuas, 14 idols he worshipped? 
You let them go? The great man, in such a quiet, happy way, replied, This time, me let all Atua's go, finish. This time, me have Jesus only. <laughs> so, anyway, here, here's, the, here's this beautiful conclusion. This is on a return in May 1936. They came back to have a conference. As they exposed Anchorage, they found several women on the beach who at once took news inland to the lake, which promptly brought down Topongi and his teacher Tupuki. The remainder of the people stayed for the service on the lake as they wished to keep Sunday as a day of rest and would not walk about on it. The morning service found nearly a hundred people gathered at the church. The rental people have very powerful voices, and their singing almost lifts the roof. It was a joyful noise to the Lord indeed. Anyway, he tells the story that um, the people all gathered the next two days at Kangava, there were nearly 300 people on the beach, most living in temporary booths made of coconut leaves. The people sat on the sand slope where the three murdered teachers had been buried. In a great horseshoe, women on one side, men on the other. They had a baptism and nine were accepted for baptism, the first ever held on Rental Island. Can you imagine those three national workers looking down from heaven and seeing 300 people gathered to hear the word of God at the very spot where their bodies had been buried? Most assuredly, said Jesus, this is the word amen repeated. Amen, amen. That's for sure. That's for sure, said Jesus. I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Pray for the suffering church today. But pray especially that wherever corns of wheat have died, wherever people have sacrificed themselves for the sake of the gospel, that it won't be long. Until all their very graves, conferences will be held. Thousands will turn to Christ. And Jesus will will receive the harvest he deserves, for he, surely, was the original corn of wheat that fell into the ground and died so that he might bring a mighty harvest of saved souls to dwell with him forever. With those three, and with the three hundred, and with multitudes of others, in the very presence of the one who gave his life that we too might live.